Hey, everybody. Welcome back to College Conversations, or as you can see here on our sign, College Combos. My name is Greg Garner, and I am here today with Professor Jeffrey Sherrod. Hey. And Professor Benjamin Reese. Hey. And we want to talk about something that uh, probably could be a little boring, uh, maybe just because people don't know too much about it. Uh, I think for folks who are engaged in the process of accreditation or who have been a part of the kind of teams that ensure accreditation is intact for other institutions, uh, it, it could be more interesting because of their experiences. Now, Jeff is our accrediting liaison yeah. with the Association for Biblical Higher Education, and we started the accreditation journey uh, in uh, 2017, yeah. I believed, as the Institute for GOD. In this episode, what I wanted to do was just talk about what is accrediting, mm -hmm. why is it important, why 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 do we do it, and then mm -hmm. also, uh, I'm I'm the kind of person that is uh, I, I I think like you guys critical about why we have to do certain things, especially when they don't make sense. Mm -hmm. Now I also know that just because it doesn't make sense to me doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. However, I think that if a person can't explain to me why it should make sense, I'm still in the camp it doesn't make sense. Right. So um, maybe that'll come up, especially when we talk about things like library mm -hmm. and um, why why that's such a big deal to uh, accrediting bodies. But Jeff, yeah. I think we're going to start with you. Okay. Tell us what accreditation is and, and how does that relate, not just to the individuative institutions mm -hmm. of accrediting bodies, but all the way up to the United States Department of Education. Yeah. Yeah, so accreditation, if we're talking about, you know, for colleges, um, this is a, like in the American context, it's actually a little bit different than anywhere else in the world. Um, it's the only country that has peer-to-peer -peer, uh, evaluation. So it's a voluntary process that people come together uh, and they decide as a uh, commission, you know, or they have representative leadership. So the opposite of peer-to-peer -peer would be like governmental bodies. Yeah, and that's every other country is that there's accreditation experts that would mm. come out and evaluate schools. Uh, American experience is a little different. Um, but yeah, so I, it's, I don't, I don't even know how I feel about that, but we have no choice in it. It's here what we it are. Is. That's, that's, <laughs> yes, that's the convention we have. Um, and I think there's pluses and minuses to that as I've thought about it, but there's, yeah, so they, you know, it's a voluntary process schools sign up for. And then, you know, if you're working with the department, um, of education, they have accreditors that accredit the accreditors. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's like, what, so like for us, that's Chia. That's Chia. That's right. Yeah. Which stands for, uh, the council for higher education administration. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, they look at the different major accrediting agencies like the association for biblical higher education, which is one of the older, accrediting that's one of the older ones. Yeah. It started in 1940 something. Mm -hmm. Um, oh. I know last yeah. year was their 75th anniversary. Right. So oh, yeah. yeah. We yeah, can they, always do the math back. Right. <laughs> 47 minutes. Um, so yeah, they, uh, you know, they come together and they have a set of standards that they're saying that they just say every school that's accredited has to meet the following standards and then you can be accredited. And so the way that they evaluate that is that you do years and years of uh, paperwork to prove that you're, uh, are those things. Uh, they have evaluation teams that come out and make sure that what you put, put on paper is accurate. Uh, and, you know, and, and then, yeah, and then it's this process of kind of moving through stages of accreditation. So whether that's, you know, kind of an applicant status first, that's what we started at. Uh, and then, you know, you go to a candidate status, um, which for the United States Department of Education, they see accredited, they don't see a difference between an accredited school and a candidate school. They don't have that designation, um, but the individual creditors do. Mm -hmm. So, and then you finally move to uh, accreditation, that's not like a once you have it, you're done forever. You maintain accreditation by mm -hmm. maintaining those standards. And those standards themselves are really standards that those – there are some the Department of Education ones, but the grand majority of them are standards that the schools themselves have come up with mm -hmm. uh, to say, what do we determine as a group we at least want <clears throat> the minimum standards to be for someone to say they're accredited? In terms of why schools do it, you know, I think it – one, there's, there's money that's available <laughs> uh, when schools do it. But also, you know, I think it does – Money that's available to them by the government by the or government, by private institutions by private that grants. would grants. Yeah, it's yeah. just, you know, like if you're applying for a grant, you can say you're accredited. That's already – They've already done some of the work, so the grantor doesn't have to look into it as much. To see uh, your legitimacy. Right, yeah. yeah. And the same thing for admissions as well, like when parents are looking at this or schools. It's an, if, they, if you're accredited, they at least know that someone, an outside agency, has looked at your school. They've done some evaluations. Uh, you know, they recognize that there's been um, 
some some expertise and some excellence uh, that that's been demonstrated to get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what it is and what it's about. Um, yeah, and I, I think where you were going was that also accreditation allows for other collegiate bodies to easier transfer credits yeah. if they know that that other college body has been vetted or approved by that accrediting institution. Yeah, that's right. Because they share the same standards. Yep, yep. And so some of those standards are, you know, real specific. So if you want to have a class, you have to have, that class has to meet for, you know, total number of what they call contact hours, mm -hmm. um, that you're in a classroom, in a seat, that you have homework standards. So it's not like, you know, degree mill is a term that gets thrown around sure. a lot. Um, uh, schools that you can kind of pay for degrees and do it, those are very common. Um, so accreditation is a way of, legitimizing that you're not a degree mill. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so for transfer credits, that's real helpful because then they can, they can say, all right, we know that this school has been vetted and they meet certain standards and we'll accept credits easier. Mm -hmm. How often are the standards updated? So there's a formal, at least for ABHE, and that's one I know most about, mm -hmm. uh, there's a formal evaluation every 10 years. We're actually in one right now. Um, oh. So I've been on some committees and task force uh, last year cool. about revising some of the standards. So yeah, every 10 years. You guys great. just talk on Zoom and... Talk on Zoom. Yeah, meet in the <laughs> annual meeting. They're kind of doing a big one right now. They're reducing. There's a 162 what they call essential elements, which is like, you know, what are the specific things that we want? Mm -hmm. And they're cutting that down by, I think, almost to 100. So really? it's a lot of those things that are getting cut out. And that will introduce more freedom to yeah, the Yeah, that's the idea. The goal, the, goal, the goal of um, of accreditation standards wasn't to be missionally prescriptive. That wasn't the goal. Like, so, you know, they, they really want schools to have the freedom to say, here's my mission and I'm going to achieve it with the things I'm doing. But what they're looking for is that you have financial solvency, that you have, um, you know, learning resources that are in place, you know, things that faculty who mm -hmm. have some decision-making power, things that they're still going to say are prescriptive, right. but they don't want to be overly prescriptive in your, in your mission. So they're taking out a lot of that stuff to give schools more freedom. Yeah. And I th would assume you appreciate that. Anytime that I think, yeah, that they're doing less overreach to allow the school. I think that we, you know, schools get together, uh, you know, they, they're, they're, I think often from a work of God, right? It's like someone did something. Christian group, schools, yeah. Christian schools. Yeah. That's what I, in the context, yeah. Like Association for Biblical Education, you know, they're looking at Christian uh, Bible schools and, and, and seminaries, but. <laughs> Yeah, so it's like when schools get together, they're trying to meet a specific need for a particular place. So I think it's great that schools have the freedom to be like, this is why God has us here. And we might look a little bit different than that major school over there, um, but we can still do it and it's still legitimate within some sure. standards. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. So, you know, our audience are students, yeah. prospective students, current students, but also parents. And a big question that a school would get right off the bat is, is the school accredited? Right. So what I want to hear from you guys are what, what you consider to be the pros and cons for accreditation. Yeah. Like what, what is, what is a benefit to accreditation? What is a challenge related right. to accreditation? Well, and, and maybe that's related to um, something that you would have insight on based upon the role that you play with respect to our institution. Like Ben, you're... You're our, our librarian, which I don't think most people understand all the school someone has to go through to yeah. become a librarian. <laughs> I didn't either, <laughs> but I figured it but, out. But it is a, it is a yeah, lot of school. Stuff, yeah. yeah. And um, your, your master's in library science, uh, UT? UTK, yep. Yeah. yeah. Master's in library and information science. Yeah, it, which which is no small task. Having having seen your, your workload, I was... I was thinking, man, you probably could have done the same workload and become a lawyer, if not more than a lawyer, with yeah. everything you had to do. It was a lot of stuff. So yeah. I am interested, like, from even your position with respect to books mm -hmm. and and uh, the, the trends that we see now with regard to um, having an audio book versus uh, a digital book or a, a paper book and the different kinds of um, digital journal memberships. And right. I'd love to hear about like how accreditation is 
taking into account all of these modalities mm -hmm. for, for reading and learning and listening. And then yeah. Jeff, from, from your position as our accrediting liaison and somebody who serves on, on a body that even helps to make consideration for these new essential elements, like what, what again are the pros and cons? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll start out here. Um, I think that for, um, let me, let me start with some cons. I, one of the things that accreditation does is it does slow down schools. Um, cause you have, you know, when you're starting a program, uh, the, you know, there, there's going to be a number of things that the accrediting body wants to see before you can do that. I'm not saying that that in itself is bad, but even if you have those things, you have to wait for committees to meet, for approvals to happen. Uh, with this, the accrediting body has made, our accrediting body has made a lot more leeway in making this a faster process. Yeah. But traditionally, that's been a real hard thing is that it can mm -hmm. slow things down where schools need to be nimble. Yeah, and um, and in my experience with ABHE, they've been fantastic about making particular considerations for the institution itself instead yeah. of binding us to some kind of generic take on where we should be and how we should go through it. They actually have taken the time to look at us right. and make consideration for us. So I, I do acknowledge that uh, a con would be it can take some time to make some yeah. things happen, but at the same time concede to the fact that accrediting bodies are – uh, aware of this, yeah, and some of them like and they're the ADHD, trying to adjust. choose to adjust and right. help. Yeah, uh, another one is, I mean, it's not a it's not a cheap process going through accreditation. You know, there's the direct cost that you have, like to to do it itself. You know, the the money that's owed to the accrediting body, but all the indirect cost too. And um, the indirect costs add up. Oh yeah, it adds up a lot of time. Uh, it's a, a lot, lot of time. time. It's a lot of a lot you know of travel. Paperwork. It's a lot of uh, bringing people to your school. Um, so you know, that's I think when schools get into it, they have to know. Um, yeah, there's there's a cost. Yeah, because I know a lot of institutions that started the accrediting journey and couldn't finish. Yeah, that, that then, happens. Yeah. And then I know some who started, couldn't finish, restarted, mm -hmm. couldn't finish, and then are trying to restart again. Yeah, that definitely happens. And I think that, you know, it's it's it, it takes a – part of even the way it's ex, it been explained to me is – what they're looking for even sometimes in those years is um, financial stability over years, enrollment stability over years. Mm. Uh, so it's not just like I have all the things today, but can you right. have them over a period of time and show sure. some show some stability? Mm. Um, but so, yeah, all that, you know, that cost adds up. Um, and then I think that sometimes there are, you know, standards that we have peer institutions. And I think that this is what I said. I think there's some pros and cons in this because uh, you get evaluators who are not experts at every school, they might know a lot about their school, mm. uh, and the accrediting agency does offer training for some of these people. But um, you know, if I'm talking to someone from our accreditor, they're going to be much more knowledgeable about the standards and how it's applied than maybe one person from a particular school that might still be an evaluator for you. Mm. Um, and so I think that that's sometimes where you kind of take some. We and we've had some evaluators who have been mm. excellent. So if I, if I'm a parent. And I see that a school has an ABHE accreditation mm -hmm. logo on their website or whatever. Right. What as a parent can I know about that school and what should I not assume is in place at that school just because they have accreditation? Okay, I think that's a good question. So one of the things that you can know is that there's been external evaluators. And I think that that, that is important, right? Like someone mm -hmm. who was a third-party source came in and said, yeah, this is this shows shows legitimacy. But more than just legitimacy, they believe that that school is um, uh, l meeting its mission. Hmm. And I think that that's like – that's really what we have to be about. Like schools should be able to say this is what we're about and then they should be able to prove that they uh, do the thing that they're about. Yeah. So I think that's one thing. And then – but what it doesn't – show necessarily, I think this is important when it comes to accreditation, is that accreditation doesn't make you, because it's so mission central, mm -hmm. it doesn't make you a different school. And I'm going to also say a better school. Mm -hmm. If the school is not like, you know, you can't, it's not going to fix a, a school that's not doing well anyway. I don't know how else to say that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's not going to take a school that's struggling and not really meeting its mission and has culture problems and then going to fix all that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you still want to look at the life of the graduates. If I'm a parent, be like, what are your graduates doing? What are they about? What kind of testimonies do you have? Because that's still, I think, the thing that should we should be proving what we're doing by more so you're saying else. While, while an accrediting association will assure families that there are some essential components and some standards that are yeah. being met, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that they are producing the kind of students that they hold themselves out to be producing. Yeah, I don't think that um, – and maybe maybe hold themselves out is not the best way of saying it. But it, if you're looking for a school that's like, all right, this school is automatically good and it's good for me because it's accredited, that's not accurate. Um, you still have to look and say – Okay, so, so you're saying a school can be accredited and <laughs> – I'm just, just for example's yeah. sake – and um, everyone that graduates from them is boring. Right. Like they can still be accredited and graduate boring people. That's, That's right, what yeah. they produce. They produce boring That's people. That's what they're about. Yeah. And so accrediting is not going to turn them into interesting people. No. And I don't think it's, it's, it's not even trying to. Yeah. You know, it's not trying to change who that So the fruit is. of the institution can exist independent of its accreditation. Right. But accreditation brings some kind of accountability. It does. For certain shared standards. Yep. Between the communities of collegiate institutions. Yeah, shared standards. And also, you know, it does ensure that because they're concerned about stability. They want schools to be around today and also tomorrow and, yeah. you know, be able to teach out. So one of the ways they look at that is to say, do you have processes down, you know, budgets, all the stuff that should be there. And they just yeah. make that make it clear that you have to have that kind of stuff there. Yeah, yeah I guess so, a degree from an institution that just shut down doesn't look good. When you go out there. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's part of it. It's like this school is on probation and it just shut down and none of this, none of the, you know, people have the jobs. Like we're not saying, oh, at least they're accredited. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's not probably, I wouldn't recommend a parent to make that kind of decision. Right. Um, but I think it does answer some questions for parents. It does, it does help them to say, yeah, there's been people that have looked at this. There's, yeah. I think the assurance that a yeah. third party group of folks who have some idea as to right. what post-secondary education should look like have come in and said, yeah, right. they're, 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 they're meeting the basic yeah. essential standard components right. of what that should look like in terms of telling us they could be around for a little bit. Yeah. 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 That's good. Now, Ben, for you with respect to the library sciences and books, I, I'm curious just on, on your thoughts. Yeah. Right? And, I mean, it's how, a broad Broad topic. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No, but it's fine. I think for me personally, I just know that a recommendation we often get is that we need to have more library holdings. And yeah. typically the, the recommendation is given to us by some librarian that's in their 70s that may not even know how to open up a Kindle or, or an right. iPad and, and access a digital holding. And so um, I think as far as uh, cost effectiveness and efficiency, we've discovered that um, these these digitally native young people coming up into college, it's it's no problem for them to um, access a digital work. And the overhead for producing the digital work is lower. And in that case, it's of lower cost, typically, mm -hmm. right? even though I know that there are variations in that. So I, I know that we, we, I mean, gosh, it's it's always a constant recommendation. For, did it happen this last time? No, I did. I don't think we actually got anything about the library, did we? That's fantastic. It wasn't one thing. Standard yeah. 10 was good. That's it. That says good something job, good about good job, you, you, Ben. That's, that's fantastic. I don't think so. But I know that for the longest time, I just I just felt like irritated by it because it was like not acknowledging what like the present, not even the future, but the present. Yeah. So now, yeah. but now I just kind of want to know from you because I'm just, uh, I'm not a library science person. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of ranting from the position that I'm in which is um, increase efficiency and lower costs for students and um, uh, make it more available on more platforms. Like when I was in law school and I had to go travel, like to do a summer internship, I would literally have to Xerox copy my big old horn books and case books. And we're talking about binders, three yeah. binders, just so I can do my reading over the course right. of several months. Uh, uh, now law school students, it, it's all on their uh, their phone. Yeah, yeah. things are, right. Things have definitely changed. Yeah. Right? So t tell tell me, tell us about it. Well, yeah, I think as like a concept, the library. I think most people think of a brick and mortar building with shelves of books, but the idea of a library, especially as it pertains to higher education, is that you want to ensure that students have uh, the resources that they need to succeed in fulfilling the goal, academic goals of the institution. So stated that broadly, that can take on a lot of different permutations. And unfortunately, we've we've sort of become, uh, like our idea of a library has become a little bit sclerotic to the degree that we're not able to respond to the new needs that students have. 
and really the needs that students mostly have, I think, in an academic environment in terms of the resources they need to succeed academically is not primarily uh, physical resources. It's mostly library services yeah. and yeah. information, right. equipping them with... There's just so much information out there, right? Right, so there's too the librarian much information should be like now. a curator or, or somebody who yeah. directs Because it used to be understand. like, wow, we have a library with 300,000 volumes. That was very impressive. Yeah. But now, and someone curated it. And somebody curated yeah. it. Um, because like people didn't have access to a lot of books. Yeah. Now we have a kind of a flip situation where students have access to too much information they really, in terms of what a library can offer, it needs to offer mostly services for things like a literacy, just digital literacy and um, research and knowing how to evaluate sources and all and that truth kind of stuff. And, and truth claims. Truth yeah. claims. So th those kinds of things. Uh, because students have more and more access to information, but their academic abilities, native academic abilities are lower and lower. So they're coming in without... Um, really an ability to Because it's through. different in like a, a high school. In a high yeah. school, there's there's not many people there uh, checking out your library holdings or developing your digital capacity for right. research. And so uh, you, you end up having a high school student graduate without much experience. And I, I think most people going to the public library are like moms with little kids yeah. these days, right? Like, like, because I, I remember growing up, going to the public library, that was like the big field trip. You learn, you get your library card, you learn how yeah. to check things out, yeah. and it was just super exciting. And I, I just don't see that with our college students coming in anymore. Yeah, no, I don't think people naturally, people just don't know how to interact with the library anymore. Really, they need uh, again, they need training and skills. Even and to you're saying too, like the library stuff. itself can be much more expansive than we typically think with respect to book holdings, right? Right. Because yeah, like as a music they... major, we had a library and it was all records. Yeah. So th so those those albums could have been uh, that that was a library, right? Right. And so like a uh, you know for instance, uh, libraries oftentimes have like. Uh, library web pages that offer a curated list of like sources online to find information. So that's not so much like having your own physical holdings, but being a place that can properly. Yeah, but speaking of physical return. holdings, would it be a library? Let's say, take for example, I'm a community development major at the institute, yeah. and my my focus is on um, sustainable building. Mm -hmm. Could the library hold a variety of equipment? That yeah. a student could check out, and that would be considered a library. Yeah, and would we would we let the accrediting association know our library includes all these tools? Yeah, yeah. Think, holdings are holdings, holdings so they are holdings, they can yeah. be they can really be. I anything. mean, the public library, Nashville's public library, you can um, like check out seeds and you other... can check out garden tools. You can check out board games. You know, all that. Yeah. Considered. So they, they've they've I mean, kind of slowly, but they libraries. Have Wait, started... how do you check out a seed? Do you give the seed back? That's after... what I asked. Well, because that... I was like, what they give it to you. So okay. it's not really checking out in terms of you have to return it. Because uh -huh. I was like, do I have to return the plant? The way they or? explained it to me was like, if you collect seeds, put them back in the pouch and bring it back. But, but they're like, do you expect to do that? And they're like, we do not expect that. <laughs> yeah. So. so there's a lot of different things. Yeah. I mean, uh, I know at, um, you know, the Bible school I went to, you could check out puppets for doing, even, you know, evangelistic <laughs> yeah. plays. So. so basically a library then is uh, an inventory space. Yeah. That is is a, a collection of resources specific to your mission yeah. that you should be able to access and, and right. return. Yeah, it's it's like do you feel like we're 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 doing that at our institution? And do you feel like other institutions are really thinking about the present need for libraries? Because I, I have to admit, like this is a really cool conversation for me because my ideas are going, you know, all the yeah. the ways in which we could collect resources that students can access to help mm -hmm. them do what the it is that they're doing. trying to do. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like, w are we able to market this and let people know our library has seed holdings, you know, yeah. whatever it is. I think it's something that, I don't know, it's an exciting frontier, but I don't think a lot of people are doing, um, doing enough. Like, I, I think that we could, uh, you know, have maybe a repository of, like A plus student papers so that if a student is worried about how to do a certain type of paper, oh, yeah, that's great. there's a repository they can go to and say, oh, this is what an exegetical paper looks like. Yeah. They got an A on this paper. Yeah. So it could even include um, uh, 
like student produced resources. Yeah, that's good. Um, so there's just a lot of different options. Yeah, like you said, like garden tools or like cameras or other things that would yeah, be any involved. kind of sometimes equipment sometimes tool, it's right? interviews, you know, with with other people, language learning tools, um, yeah, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, um, and just ju- kind of preserve stories even from people around the world. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I'm I'm familiar with that aspect of it. I just think when you when you have an accrediting body that's going to come in and look at your holdings, like are they are they making a big deal over the variety of holdings or are they just counting holdings? Well, I think that for us the question that they're primarily asking is does the library resources um support the academic programs? You know, so for us we have our our programs are in biblical studies and community development. And when you when we give a report for both of those things, we show strong because we have holdings, lots and lots of holdings, basically, and both of those two categories, and just those two categories. As far as physical library, so then, but then for us, based upon what you're saying, there's some work to do with respect to um, accumulating the inventory that would excite a, a, a young person's involvement in library like resources yeah, like yeah. like even some of the things you're talking about it'd be so cool to have like a, a I guess it would be a computer with a hard drive or a cloud drive that that has categorized all of these um interview videos that we have over the years yeah. particularly with our um developing country communities right. so that people could create a history out of that. Right. And then if there seems to be a living component to the library because a student could take that information and then help either categorize it, organize yeah. it, tag it. Yeah. Yeah. The, li- the librarian is, you know, they're, they're a service worker. They're trying to help students to, con- to connect information. They're, they're an archivist. They're a researcher. Yeah. You know, they're, they take on an important role in an institution um, you know, I heard someone rec- you know, say it this way. I wouldn't say it how they said it, but they, they said the library is the heart of the academic institution. I don't know if I would say it quite that, quite that way, but I get the idea that you want to have as much resources around that just support students learning more and, yeah. and having access to the, the right kind of information yeah. Um, yeah. that makes them a better student. But it has, you know, like I, I think um, it has to be a service. So right. you have to think through how to make these things relevant to students, to make them intuitive to students. Because long long, um, long gone are the days where you can kind of put up a library and a student will look at a library and know how to interact with that institution. Right. So they need like some help. And they, I, I, yeah. I think too, along these lines, like one of the stories I've heard recently, and I think that this is good, is that they've said some of what they think is can be most detrimental to a library is when they get these huge donations and mm. they build these big buildings. Yeah. Because it, it can it can just turn into we're good because we have holdings. Yeah. And then some of these really large schools get. I mean, we've had schools remarks. trying to dump on us all kinds all their holdings of books, right? because all their holdings. it's it's really about services. Yeah. And, and connecting comes, to students and it comes down to services. Yeah. Yeah. So so Ben, if you were to dream a little bit about the the library ten years from now, what would it look like? Ooh, ten years from now. Yeah, at the Whoa. institute. What would it look like ten years from now? Hmm. I think it would – I mean I think it would have a lot of the components that we've talked about so mm-hmm. far. I think that – I think in terms of a physical space, it would be a space that could like ignite people's imaginations for mm-hmm. what's possible. And like you know, in terms of like checking out videos or interviews or seeing uh, – connecting with work that's going around the world or getting tools or ideas. And then a place where they can uh, feel uh, safe to ask – academic questions because yeah, i think help. that's where where you're 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 pushing me towards is yeah. it seems like you would you'd probably like to have a couple people manning that library available to serve and help right. people find things at any time that you're open yeah right which i think i think is beautiful because uh, even when you're talking about the kind of holdings i don't think i would need to check out a digital file as much as i would need to be shown how to access, how to access it from it. my yeah. home right. computer. that's right yeah Right. So there, that service is there. But there are some other tangibles that maybe need to be in there that I would need to check out. Yeah. yeah like, uh, for example, let's say at our school, community development, we're talking about textiles. And, and we know now that there's like um, 3D printing that's involved in all of that. And a student's exploring it that you'd have a 3D printer to check out. Yeah. Right. Or you have an, an, even an old sewing machine. Yeah. To check out. Yeah. And that somebody there could show them how to use it. 
Right? Mm-hmm. That's the kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I think. And I think, uh, and again, I, I think a place where students feel like, oh man, I have a question about this homework or I don't know what to do here. I know that just the place to go to. I, I feel comfortable because I think students today have a really hard time asking for help. Yeah. So they need a place that kind of inspires. And I think that's where physicality still matters. Yeah. Like, as I know, we, I agree, like in terms of the holdings, it makes much more sense to do them all digitally. Yeah. But in terms of a space that yeah. students can go to. Yeah. I'm just picturing like, like a big yep. open space with like nooks right. and, and stations. Yeah. And, and you know like you it's, can find it's, yeah, it's separated on like, overarching knowledge factors, right? This is the science section. Yeah. This is the technology section. This is the philosophy section. And and it's designed to accommodate the types of questions that would emerge yeah. in those respective fields. And um, I think fields. it's going to move towards, uh, again, more student-generated uh, material that then like kind of feeds back into the library. Like let's say they rent out a sewing machine. Yeah. Maybe they take a picture story of what they did with that sewing machine and how it went. And then that gets archived with... Something, and and I know. think if students know that they're becoming a part of history in that way, right. they'll be much more um, excited to participate. Mm-hmm. I think otherwise it sounds like an assignment. But yeah. if you realize, no, this is going to be now held on archive for other people to access, that that's yeah. that's pretty promising. I, I really do think with our institution that we should do that a lot more with a, a bunch of the kind of work product mm-hmm. that students produce. Like, you know, they do the city projects. Yeah. Like having like a city model, putting it in the glass case, right. and then having that, um, uh, then you could turn that into a picture later when another new mm-hmm. one replaces like a this 3D one. 3D rendered yeah, picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just, there's just a lot like that. But you have to have the the resources to pay the people because it's a service oriented. It's not yeah. a goods thing. Right. And in my experience, most people want to buy the books. They don't want to pay the salary. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And you got to really think through how you're going to, which is really what library science is about, how you're going to categorize and organize what you take in so that it is available and that takes some forethought to think through that's a lot of fun well guys thanks for this conversation on accreditation even got into library science a a little bit everybody when you are thinking about school and you're thinking about a college accreditation is an important component and it's a good idea for you to have a basic knowledge hopefully this episode gave you a little bit of that and that you can make a more effective decision when it comes to choosing Mm -hmm. your school. And then also think about that library space. And it sounds like what's more important than evaluating the physical space is evaluating the philosophy of those who are running that space and figuring out how you can be a part of a future that is going to archive what you do to be part of history. Mm -hmm. We'll see you guys next time. 